SYS presents Adventures in Online Education. Hello friends, you're listening to SYS Presents Adventures in Online Education. I'm your host, Natalie Conway. Thanks for being here. On today's episode, I have the pleasure of speaking with Colin Seal. Colin was born and raised in Brooklyn, New York, where struggles in his upbringing gave birth to his passion for educational equity. Tracked early into gifted and talented programs, Colin was afforded opportunities his neighborhood peers were not. Using lessons from his experience as a math teacher, later as an attorney, and now as a keynote speaker, contributor to Forbes, The 74, Edutopia, and Education Post, and author of Thinking Like a Lawyer, a framework for teaching critical thinking to all students, and Tangible Equity, a guide for leveraging student identity, culture, and power to unlock excellence in and beyond the classroom. Colin founded ThinkLaw a multi-award-winning organization to help educators leverage inquiry-based instructional strategies to close the critical thinking gap and ensure they teach and reach all students, regardless of race, zip code, or what side of the poverty line they are born into. When he's not serving as the world's most fervent critical thinking advocate, or tweeting from at Colin E. Seal, Colin proudly serves as the world's greatest entertainer to his two young children. Today, Colin and I talk about equity in our online classes, being disruptive with a purpose, and unlocking brilliance in our students. You are going to be inspired by this conversation. So, you ready? Let's learn something new. Colin Seal, thank you so much for being on the podcast today. I am so excited to talk about equity in online classrooms with you. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you. I'm excited to spark this conversation. Absolutely. So you have a new book out called Tangible Equity, a guide for leveraging student identity, culture, and power to unlock excellence in and beyond the classroom. That was released in May of 2022. Congratulations. We are seeing a lot more texts for educators on the topic of equity, and that is awesome. We need to be thoughtfully cultivating equitable learning environments for our kids. What does your text offer that other books on the same topic don't right now? What's the unique draw? Yeah, so... um, To give a kind of a context about this book, Tangible Equity, um, my life is a product of this, okay? I am a math teacher who decided to go to law school at night while teaching during the day, which I do not recommend. Do not try that at home. It's not a really good strategy. <laughs> that sounds it. terrible. But what that did, though, is it was so special to have this lifetime where I was always a gifted I wouldn't say an underachiever, but a selective achiever. And I never really got really good grades. But in law school, I graduated at the top of my class because the whole nature of what it was was so different. The way that we were able to, to think on our toes, the way that we had all these spaces where we can be disruptive on purpose, be disruptive with a purpose. It all ties me to the idea that my existence as the professional that I am today is a part of its own kind of disruption. Because I was born as a kid who was on free and reduced lunch, who really was in the struggle growing up. My family is all from Barbados, so I was the first generation born in this country. My father was incarcerated for a decade for selling drugs, and I was able to get this excellent education, have these different kinds of outcomes. And when I think about what equity means, I think the biggest number one difference about tangible equity and a lot of other books that are out there is how we define it. So we define equity as the work that we do that reduces the predictive power that demographics so often have on outcomes. You all know what that means. Like that predictive power where I can say, oh, the other side of the tracks, north of the interstate. I can look at all these different issues and the people over there that speak that language, that kid that has the IEP on a special education designation. So often we can predict what the outcomes are going to be for that kid's life, for that community. And if we had real equity, that would no longer be the case. 
which would mean we got to do things that are going to be more disruptive. So what tangible equity also does is it lays out a very practical guide to make this actionable at the classroom level so that it's not just this idea of teaching our kids how to navigate the system. But how do we create a different kind of thing altogether where our kids are able to navigate and access the system, yes, but also being able to ask the questions necessary to make these systems more fair, more equitable. Like Dr. King once had that phrase, that quote, like the arc of uh, moral humanity is, is history is, is long, but it bends towards justice. We help train you on how to be the hammer because it doesn't bend by itself. So that's the real difference. And we do it through a lot of practical strategies that teachers can use on a Tuesday morning in October versus some of the pie in the sky concepts that we see in a lot of other kinds of uh, uh, frameworks. Absolutely. Sometimes I'll read texts on this topic and you feel like, okay, I as the teacher can't necessarily engage in these because this is a top down systemic change that I am not able to produce right now or kind of that pie in the sky idea where you're like, okay, well, I can get started on this. But like next week, this doesn't give me something that I can actually do with kids. So I appreciate that your book, Tangible Equity, is actually tangible and giving teachers something they can do that that week or immediately to change how they're serving kids, to change the structure or the system within their classrooms. Is that what I'm hearing you say? Because that's really exciting. Yeah, and and, and I, think, I think it's important to think about this, even in the context of like, you know, virtual learning environments, right? So let's say I'm looking at U.S. history and I've got this, you know, on a revolutionary war. And my learning goal is that I want my students to know all the key dates and events and, and, and people that are part of the revolutionary war. So often... This is the thing where we start talking about like just kind of memorizing and regurgitating the information from what I just did. But what if we upped it up an ante, right? And I'm not talking about like wax museum kinds of things or things that are super duper involved. I'm thinking, what if we ask our kids to determine what was the most significant date in the Revolutionary War? Who was the most significant person? What was the most significant location in a Revolutionary War? And now... We can all see that that goes a little bit deeper, but Natalie, can I ask you a question, a follow-up question? If I took an imaginary student who actually memorized everything there was about the Revolutionary War, right? Let's say the student had everything memorized. Why might that question about significance still be challenging for that student? Absolutely, because they're going to have to sift through and start synthesizing information. They're going to have to start thinking about what it is they know. Mm -hmm. And have memorized. There's no clear right answer. Yeah. Right? I'm going to have to say this and be able to justify it. So how do I figure this out? I've got to scaffold the thinking. We've got this low floor, high ceiling framework with intangible equity that helps you scaffold the thinking. So maybe I'll start that lesson with talking about, well, who is the most significant person in your household? What is the most significant store in your community? Who's the most significant person in your school building? And now we got kids making arguments like, okay, the principal, maybe, maybe my favorite teacher, maybe even my best friend. Actually, actually, I'm 100% sure it's me, okay? I am clearly the most significant person, and I want all y'all to know this. But what really matters here is that now I'm viewing this text through the lens of significance. Mm -hmm. I have a personal connection. And what's so important about this text, Natalie, is there are a ton of books written about culturally responsive pedagogy. And sometimes we read it and we think that it's about throwing the name Tyrone and the math problem about Kwanzaa supplies. And it's so much deeper than that. If we're doing this the right way, we can create a space where the very nature of how we ask a question allows kids to bring who they are and how they are into it so that it actually deepens the learning outcome. I, I love that. And it's making me think of essential questions, right, which a lot of curricula include or teachers are always trying to develop. What's what's be a good like hook, a great essential question. And it feels like you're giving us awesome ideas for how we can enter in to our standards based standards aligned curriculum, but we can enter into it in a thoughtful way so that kids are becoming thinkers instead of regurgitators of information they're really thinking and I love that connection you made to like hey yeah you could ask kids who's the most significant person in our school what's the most significant place in your neighborhood all of that especially those of us who teach online our students are coming from a variety of neighborhoods a variety of towns um, or across a whole state potentially 
And so to make that connection to what you're learning in school and collectively, we're all learning about this one topic, but then tangentially, how does this apply to you and your personal lived experience? That's very essential. It's so important. So it feels like you're giving us these great essential questions. And I always appreciate that. And I think it's important to point out, and, and, and I talk about this in my first book, Thinking Like a Lawyer, that a lot of times the way it's structured, you might see some really powerful, essential question at the start of a lesson, but because of how the lesson is structured, kids have no capability to even answer that question, right? And a lot of what we talk about in Thinking Like a Lawyer are like, what are the different critical thinking strategies we can do to get there? But in tangible equity, we go one step further, which is, you know... If my child is learning something, there's that phrase, knowledge is power. But in Dr. Kendi's How to Be an Anti-Racist book, one of the most powerful lines in that book to me is like, knowledge isn't actually power. It's not. Knowledge is only power if it's being used towards the struggle for power. So in this case, what the goal is, is our kids cannot just be in a space where they're able to ask the essential question. I want them to create an essential question. I want them to be able to think about like, what am I doing with this knowledge to solve an essential problem? Because if we're gonna create kids who can lead, who can innovate, who can break what needs to be broken, they need to not just be mere problem solvers, they gotta be problem finders. And that's what we set them on a path for. And what this is, is a deep level of inquiry that I often say, it's not about empowering kids. It's not about empowering kids. Kids already have the power. It's about letting them hold a mirror up to themselves so they can see their own power. It's about providing several outlets so that they can actually galvanize that power. You give me so much to think about. I love it. I'm jotting down notes faster than I can think and write here. That really resonates deeply that we're not empowering kids, that they have the power. We're showing them that they have the power within them. And that that's an awesome turn. That's an awesome lens to look through in a different way to think about it. We're not empowering them. They have the power within already. That's theirs inherently. How can we help them see it for themselves and then use it? And so often in education, kids will ask us from elementary to high school, you know, why do I need to know this? Why am I learning this? And if we're looking at what we're doing through an equity lens, then there's going to be a really deep, meaningful why. And it might be different for each kid is that would that be okay like if the why of learning something an outcome or a problem that they're solving could be slightly different depending on the student for sure especially because part of tangible equity right part of reducing that predictive power that demographics have on outcomes is being able to name that reality okay i taught algebra too i taught pre-calculus so at some point when kids would ask me like why they're learning this i'm not gonna lie and say they're gonna be graphing polynomials as a 25 year old just because i'm gonna be honest and i'm gonna be honest about a reality that i hate to admit the reality that i hate to admit is that although my grandmother and mother both came from a background that required them to often work twice as hard to get half as far. Although I was raised as a black boy in Brooklyn to work twice as hard to get half as far, we haven't done enough to disrupt that. And the reality is for some people, because of your skin color, your gender, your ability, whatever it is, you're still under that different set of rules where you gotta work twice as hard to get half as far. So part of why we take classes like pre-calculus and AP human geography is because we need to send signals out to the universe that I am not to be underestimated, that I am not to be overlooked. And this is why, contrary to a lot of popular belief in different circles, I think standardized testing is crucial, crucial for kids in the struggle to be able to excel on because they can't just pass. They don't have the luxury of not passing. In fact, if you think about what it means to live in a true meritocracy, which we do not have, We have to be able to acknowledge that anyone who requires merit to succeed is going to need a lot more than merit. So part of what we do on Tangible Equity is we even unpack some of the hidden curriculum, the hidden curriculum to the pathway that our kids need to get to transformative sort of outcomes. Because if you want to interrupt intergenerational poverty, you got to be able to look in your classroom and see a future doctor, a future lawyer, a future engineer, even a future educator. And guess what? They got to pass tests. So... That's kind of a a real practical way that we go about doing it. And to give you another instructional example, I can see classrooms around the country looking at a standardized test question. 
And instead of just going through all the low level stuff that goes with a regular standardized test, we asked the question, what's the most wrong answer? What's the best wrong answer? Right? Most wrong could be according to my subjective understanding, which one is so far off from what really the right answer ought to be. And then what's the best one? Maybe there's a real good one that would probably be likely to trick a lot of people. Right? If I said it's a $20 shirt and it's 10% off, I can see a lot of people picking 10 as the answer because they just subtract 20 minus 10. These are the kinds of things that allow my kids to think like a test maker. To think like a test maker, not just learning basic low-level test taking skills. And these are the kinds of things you need to do to be able to disrupt. Honestly, I applied to law school late, after the deadline. I took the LSATs late, after the deadline. But because I scored the 95th percentile on the LSAT, I got in before people that actually applied on time. Because I had to be able to write my ticket in a way where there was no question about my credential. Yeah, doors, doors open with scores, doors open with achievement on standardized measures that we value highly, or at least currently we do still. And I think it's really smart because my gut is like, no, standardized tests, what, no, let's move past them. But you're right. And my gut is always like, oh, I don't want to prepare kids for a test. I want to prepare them to be thinkers. But the reality of the situation for more than half of our students is that you can't just do that. That's a huge disservice if you're just doing that. That What you're talking about, too, is higher order thinking still. You're teaching them by looking at a test in that way. And what's the best wrong answer? Okay, why would someone pick that? Okay, you're not going to pick that one. Here's why, right? So they're looking out for that. That's awesome. That's empowering. That's pulling back the hidden curriculum. Yes. And we're not teaching to the test. We're teaching to the test format. Should our kids not know how things are laid out? Like, and this is what I talk about when I say we got to be explicit about the game. We have to call it out, call it for what it is. It's a game to be played. And when I, at Tangible Equity, I talk a little bit about the case for this, right? Where I don't care if you grow up or if you live in a rural community, an urban community, like why these things matter, why our system is the way that it is today is not by accident. It's not by accident. And it'll be wrong to call it a broken system because again, The system was very purposefully designed to create the outcomes that we see today. But as educators, what I don't want to hear is, I'm just a teacher. As a teacher, you have inherent power. You've got so much more autonomy than you can think about. And we have this whole framework where we actually help you work through any issue that you're facing as a classroom educator that's like really impacting your ability to make equity real in your school system, right? For me, as a brick and mortar educator, I had a problem. Even though I was a black male educator, I was kicking out black males out of my classroom at twice the rate as anybody else in my team. Mind you, I was the only black male educator on my whole team. They were my why, but I was still doing this, right? Like my 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 inherent like good good intentions didn't stop me from doing that. Only thing that stopped me from doing that is being able to be really clear about what I was doing and have a pathway for unraveling that. So maybe you start looking at patterns and trends about What are the demographics of the kids who you're getting less engagement than you need to? Who are you not? When you look at parent engagement and parent involvement, is there certain trends about like what parents you're like hearing from, what parents you're not hearing from? If I start looking at like, why is it that some students don't seem to be as responsive in this discussion thing or this thing over here? And most importantly, if you look at what our kids need for the 21st century workforce, or basically to just advance where we're at as a society. Because honestly, I'm done with the adults. All of my hope is on our kids, 100%, right? How can they learn to listen to understand, speak to be understood, and disagree without being disagreeable if we offer no platform at all for our kids to ever directly engage with one another as, as close to the real human being form as possible? So... I'm always pushing this, and when I was a keynote speaker at the Digital Learning Annual Conference this past February in in Atlanta, I'm like, I get it that some models, as far as choice goes, kids really needed to have it set up to be asynchronous. But if we can use that creativity, find some framework, some some kind of way that our kids can actually be able to engage engage with one another, even if they got a schedule on their own, on their own time, I just don't know how our society will be better without that. I just don't know that a completely
deeply personalized and individualized learning experience that does not prioritize the education as a collective. This idea to learn from others, to grow from others. I don't know how that's going to serve our kids into this framework where they've got to be game changers. Absolutely. I think that's really important for us as online educators to remember. And so many online schools are synchronous, which is great. But allowing kids that opportunity to participate in discussions, to participate in Socratic seminars, whatever it might be, so that, like you said, they can be disagreeing without being disagreeable. They can learn how to form a good argument and back up their ideas and opinions with facts and true information. That's all really important. And we can't just throw kids on a program or have them work through a curriculum asynchronously. We need and we value collaboration, communication. And so absolutely, it has to be in real time. And there's many different ways that we can do that. We can do that through discussion boards. We can do that through live class time. We can do that through interactive whiteboards online. So there's a lot of outlets for that. And I think it's really awesome that you highlighted that importance because it's a key element to a strong online program. We're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we're going to talk more about Think Law and how that lawyering background of you as an educator is impacting your work further. What's the one thing all online schools and programs struggle with? student engagement, and the ability to truly personalize interventions. How do we solve those problems? With the use of Admin Dash, a brand new Canvas LTI tool from SYS Education. Admin Dash allows online teachers to see a risk assessment score that proactively identifies students who may need more specialized attention or intervention, and offers a communication log that provides an outlet for complete transparency among teachers, admin, students, and families. At just 99 cents per student per year, and with no minimum price and no fees, you can't afford to not use Admin Dash. For more information about Admin Dash, contact sales at syseducation.org and start connecting proactively with your online learners. Welcome back, online educators. I'm talking to Colin Seal today. In addition to being an author, Colin is also the founder and CEO of Think Law, whose mission is to help educators teach critical thinking to all students. Colin, you also have resources for parents on raising critical thinkers. And we love this focus at SYS because we're firm believers in teaching critical thinking as part of 21st century skill building. Along with creativity, communication, and collaboration, like we were just talking about before the break. So if an educator or a district is looking to bolster their curriculum so that there is more critical thinking occurring in the classroom, what tools does Think Law offer? Why should they be investing? And is Think Law kind of the natural manifestation of your lawyer background, or how did that come to be? Sure, sure. So, um, as I mentioned earlier, I'm, I'm a teacher who went to law school at night. And when I was practicing law, you know, I, I, I knew that growing up, I did not see a whole lot of black attorneys. Um, so I would go to a lot of schools in Las Vegas, Nevada, and talk to a lot of kids. And I remember teachers would be like, I don't get it. How'd you get those kids to write? How'd you get that kid to be so engaged? I didn't even know that that kid was so brilliant. And what would happen is when I would bring in all these real life cases, Th their minds would explode, right? Like if, if I have a scenario where I'm talking about a dude who had 150 foot long sub, uh, Subway sandwiches and got really mad when those foot longs turned out to not be 12 inches long, actually. Now there's this massive class action lawsuit and our kids got to think like negotiators. Like how might I settle this dispute when it comes to being Subway? But like, well, 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 you know what? You, you probably need fewer carbs in your life anyhow. Well, you still get the same amount of meat. Well, depending on the elevation, break a break to certain temperatures. And the thing is, what I loved about this, what, why I found the power here is we got some kids we sometimes call unteachable. We got some kids we sometimes say, oh, y'all are book smart, but y'all are street smart. When we talk about street smart, I try to unpack that. Like, what does that actually mean? Street smart is just smart. I could think of my toes. I could play all the angles. I could optimize constraints. And we've created a framework where, again, I could be disruptive on purpose. I could be disruptive with a purpose. If I spent my whole life sitting in classrooms like, oh, well, what happened was, now there's an entry point for me to dig in deeper. Whether it's because of a deeper level of engagement, just things that kind of are just more provocative and get me going, that's kind of how that sort of uh, came about. But what we do right now at Think Law is 
we look at school systems and we say, you already have your curriculum. You've already adopted the curriculum. What if we just took the curriculum we already had and we help embed these culturally responsive critical thinking frameworks on top of that so that it doesn't feel like one more thing? That's our number one thing that we do. We help school systems create this whole platform with critical thinking embedded into it so it doesn't feel like one more thing. We have our own curriculum that helps you supplement that, right? And it gives you a very practical how of how to do it. Because one thing I hate about being a teacher is I'll go to these trainings and it'll be cool and I might learn how to do it technically, but without actual resources, it's hard. But we have actual resources that help you actually deliver this kind of content. And it's really popular for um, online programs that are looking to be like, all right, I want a better social emotional resource that's more kind of centered around who kids are instead of telling them how they need to be. I want to have more engagement in social studies. I want to have a gift and a talented program or something more creative for intervention that isn't just all this dull remediation and, you know, going over all the busy work over and over and over again. So... We realized, though, you can't have a critical thinking revolution without our families. And that's why we came up with the Raising Critical, Thinking, uh, Raising critical Thinkers portal, um, which parents can actually get directly themselves at RaisingCriticalThinkers.us, or schools can buy on behalf of them. And we even do parent workshops like, why is the milk in the back of the grocery store? That's, that's the name of the workshop. Why is the milk in the back of the grocery store? Because what we're trying to highlight is that there are everyday things that are happening in our world that as parents... You understand, you get, but our kids might not have actually sat and questioned it before. So it's whole, this is whole kind of attitude around questioning. We even have games. One game is called Informed Opinion where I give you a topic and all we do is ask questions. Okay, so here's the point that I'm going to give you right now, Natalie, just a sample of that. Colin's car won't start. What questions do you have based off of that information? Colin's car won't start. Oh, so many. How old is Colin's car? Does Colin's car have gas? Does Colin's car have the oil? Gas is man. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Natalie's car does not have gas in it right now. Lots of questions. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, is, is Colin using the right key? Right. There's, there's all these things that start to come up. And if I'm getting into this questioning piece, what am I doing? The same thing I talked about earlier. I'm teaching young people to be problem finders, not just problem solvers. If, if, if that becomes a habit, because they're getting constant practice and nurturing at school. Then they're going home and they're getting constant practice and nurturing at home that will no longer be in the space where we are today. Because today, critical thinking is still treated like a luxury good. We say it matters. We say everyone should have access to it, but we reserve it for kids in the gifted program, the magnet program, the honors program. But how could it be an honor to get something that we've deemed so essential to success in academic career and life? So this is making that much more equitable. Absolutely. As a special ed teacher, I find that a lot of the purchase curriculum that we would use over the past 15, almost 20 years did not have critical thinking as a component of it. It was very much direct instruction and it was very skill based. And I think kids need some skills and base knowledge to be able to engage meaningfully in in some critical thinking and some problem solving. For sure, you can't just dive into something. If I've never seen a car, have no idea about cars, like I'm not going to know why your car isn't started. But I think sometimes we give too much value maybe to what that base knowledge is or how much that base knowledge is. Because it's, I couldn't fix a car for the life of me. I can't change the oil in my truck, but I could answer that question, right? You know, so like my base knowledge doesn't have to be maybe quite as deep as we think it does. So I think that's a really good challenge for, for teachers working with students who have been labeled as underachieving or having a learning disability. Like, yeah, well, maybe if we start with critical thinking about things they do know about or things they are interested in, can we go from there? Moreover, their diversion thinking becomes a massive asset when it comes to that kind of exploration. You asked earlier about like how it connects to being a lawyer and how that all came about. As a lawyer, I worked at the kind of firm where we were a small office, but it was a really big firm, which means we didn't really specialize. I've had to do every kind of case. And when I'm doing a case, I need to be able to say, all right, like I gotta know this industry we're talking about, whether it's this construction case where we gotta figure out whether this environmental cleanup work can be attached as part of the house to be a lean. Whether I'm trying to figure out all the dynamics of an engine transmission 
to figure out if this car dealership should be off the hook for this transmission error. Whether I've got to figure out, and I got to admit this, it's kind of ridiculous. But I probably know more about the anatomies of 80-year-old women with multiple pregnancies than anybody else my age should know. Why do I know it? Because I represented a pelvic mesh manufacturer. And I know everything there is to know about pelvic mesh. It is a lot of things to know, but why did I have to know it? Because I had to be able to like create reports that challenge the expertise of PhDs who have done this for 30 years. What is that? What is that? It's learning how to learn. How many of you as listeners have had to unlearn something in the last two years? Have had to relearn something? Have had to learn something you never thought you would ever have to learn? And when you think about learning how to learn, who are our experts as students of learning how to learn? The kids that don't get it right away. They learn how to learn all the time. And if you think about one of the really essential skills for high-level success in online learning platforms, that efficacy that comes from learning how to learn, from being able to navigate your way, that's so powerful. It's so powerful. It creates a level of autonomy, executive functioning. There's so much magic that happens from being able to get a lot of practice at that. So that's how the thinking like a lawyer world kind of emerges with this critical thinking thing that we believe is fundamental to equity. Awesome. Yes, I love just spinning everything on its head and seeing the kids who some of us look at and look at their deficits and saying, no, these are assets. These are skills. This is a good thing. These kids are experts at learning how to learn. And you're so right, especially in an online setting, there is so much to learn. There is beyond hidden curriculum, there's hidden technology, right? And the, the whole thing of it, just how to get in, how to get engaged, how to get started. I think that's really great for kids as well who may struggle to feel like they do know how to do it or they can get good at this because when you give them permission to learn how to learn and when you give them permission to experiment and do some things, that is a self-esteem boost. That is making them more you know, like their self-efficacy goes up. And I think that's awesome for kids. That's what we need. And that's what we want. And that's the whole point of schooling, right? Isn't just to acquire facts or a certain set of knowledge. It's to become this thinker, this problem finder, like you say, who's going to contribute positively to our community and, and to make it a better place to be. I mean, that's, that's it. I'm with you. The, the hope is in the younger generations and it always, always is. So what are we doing to support that? And I love, love, love that you partner with families because there just is no teaching in isolation. There is no school that exists in a bubble and the communities and the families that are supporting students, that's integral. That's always so important to success of a program, of a student, all of it. And I think it's important to note this too. Um, I could talk all and on and on about critical thinking and unlocking brilliance. But one of the things that tangible equity really questions and attempts to answer is this really important prerequisite. Before we talk about critical thinking, before we talk about unlocking brilliance, we need to ask ourselves, do our kids have the psychological safety to be brilliant? Have I created the kinds of learning environments where my kids have the psychological safety to be brilliant, to be bold, to bravely make mistakes, to question their own assumptions? These are all the things that come apart of a culture of critical thinking where it's actually safe. And I think sometimes it's really easy to think about this from a parenting context, because maybe some of us grew up under these contexts where because I said so was kind of the way of the land. The reality is, though, we cannot build critical thinkers in a because I said so culture. And as we're speaking, I, I, just, I just read a news story about a district in northwestern Texas that is banning skirts and skorts past the age of four, banning hoodies. And I'm just like, if you're this obsessed with control, if you're this obsessed with the control, I don't even want to see what it looks like to attempt to be a critical thinker in those kinds of classrooms. I can't expect to be psychologically safe to be a critical thinker when I could get in trouble for wearing a skirt in sixth grade. Bonkers. So yeah. this is just to push us, to push our thinking, to see how can we think about that psychological safety? What would it mean for your kids to be able to take more risks intellectually? What do you have to do to get there? 
And a lot of the grappling, a lot of the funk, a lot of the drama that we set up in tangible equity in terms of practical classroom strategies is going to be a great way to start establishing that culture that is so necessary. It really is. I think sometimes we put soft skills or we call them soft skills even and we put them to the side and the beginning of the year we're like this is what we need to focus on in the classroom or this is what I need to focus on in my curriculum and we get bogged down with the data and all of that and really such an important thing the only thing that needs to happen at the start of the year and then continue throughout but is that authentic connection between and among students and between teacher and students and I think Building that safe place comes from trusting and respecting your students. And that is not easy to build or to start with sometimes, but it's, it's the only thing. If kids feel like this is a room, this is a space where I am trusted, where I trust others, and where I have mutual respect for others, and there's I feel respected by my elders and by my peers. Like, okay, I, let's dive in. I can do this. I think that psychological safety is really important for teachers too. So in our schools, making sure that if I'm an administrator, I'm thinking, do my teachers feel that I trust them? Do my teachers feel that I have a deep and authentic respect for what they do and the skills they have and what they're trying to achieve? Like, and that is a trickle down, right? That's one of those things that teachers can model, but that admin can also and, and should also model. And I think it's important to note this one thing from a law school context, okay? There's like a terrifying view that some people have from law school about being on. And when you're on, right, in a law school class, you're on, you're basically up against your professor having to speak sometimes for 45 minutes, answering all kinds of questions. But what's so important about that? They're giving you the presumption of expertise. They're giving you a presumption of your belief, of your capacity to be able to handle this. And what I see there is a massive sense of teacher confidence. A massive sense. I see it very often in like music and band teachers. Y'all don't have no damn rhythm at all, but I'm guaranteed. But at the end of this year, we can be an award-winning band. Because they've seen it happen so many times. They know you'll be flustered initially. So they're confident, right? So you talk about that psychological safety. As a teacher, I can feel safe in knowing that my kids might not get this right this second. But over time, they'll get there. And as a kid, if I can get comfortable with that learning curve being the norm, man, that's for the rest of my life. I can yes. do anything in any field, anytime. Yeah. That's it, right? I'm always psyched when someone's like, and this relates to real life. And this is real life. Yeah, these are life skills that we value in adults and we value in our coworkers and we value in our friends and ourselves. And like, yes, this is what we want. We want kids to be risk takers. We want kids to persist and persevere and not give up. And then also to feel like if I'm in this position, it's because I belong here. I can own this space and I can, I can be here. Yeah, someone has that faith in me. Colin, I could talk to you for days, but I know we don't have days. So I have just one final wrap-up question for you. If there was one thing, material or otherwise, that you could give to every teacher in the United States, what would it be and why? I would give them a framework that allows them to move beyond compliance. Listen, I've done workshops all over the nation. I don't know the exact number, but I would bet that 85% at least of educators become educators because this thing really worked well for them. Right? They were the kids who got good grades, who did their homework, who didn't really get in any major trouble, at least inside of school. They knew how to really play the game. And in many ways, compliance just breathes off their pores. So here's what I'm gonna ask you all to do if that's you, if you fall into that category, okay? You've heard that phrase, don't ask permission ask for forgiveness. My thing is, don't ask at all. Why are you even asking? Why are we even asking? Right? Th 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 there's some level where I start seeing like, okay, if there is a kid that fell off of a swing and is bleeding profusely from their head, and you happen to see it, you don't have to ask if you can intervene and call 911 and get help. You just do. 
And there are matters in our public education systems that are super urgent. There are problems and challenges that are super urgent. Why are we even asking? That's what I urge you to do. I urge you to think about you have the power. You've got a scope of authority where you don't actually need any approval. There's things you could do on a daily basis that are bold, that are brave. And when I talk about bold and brave, Natalie, we mentioned essential questions. I remember an educator telling me, well, I don't really use the essential questions because I find sometimes they have nothing to do with the lesson. Well, have you considered trying a different essential question? Wait, can I do that? I'm like, you can do anything you want. You can do anything you want. And this is what I'm asking you to do. We are in a space where if we're trying to go back to the definition of equity, reduce the predictive power that demographics have on outcomes, that is relentless work. That is persistent work. That is defiant work. So literally, compliance is not going to lead us there. Understand the assignment. Navigating the system plus dismantling the system. Playing the game plus being able to slay the game. And if you understand that assignment, then we'll really be on a pathway forward to make equity tangible at the classroom level. I love it. I want every teacher to have that framework and I want every teacher to feel from you and from their teams and from their work that permission to disrupt and that urgency around it, that disruption on purpose. Awesome. Colin, thank you so much for your time today and for all of your wisdom and your awesome support and respect and trust that you obviously have for teachers and and folks in education. If people want to find out more about your work or want to reach out to you, where should they go? Sure. Go to thinklaw.us, request a quote. You can buy either book, both Tangible Equity, Thinking Like a Lawyer, anywhere you buy books. You could also buy both books from us that come with book studies. Book studies are really cool because they come with a a live session with me at the end virtual. We get to kind of go back and forth. And I've done that with a lot of different virtual schools. And then um, follow me on Twitter at uh, ThinkLawUS or at Colin E. Seal for my personal Twitter. Awesome. Thank you so much. I hope this is the first of many conversations we get to have. And thanks for all the work you're doing for our kids. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this episode of SYS Presents Adventures in Online Education. Special thanks to my guest today, Colin Seal. Colin taught us to unlock brilliance in our students and move beyond compliance to build psychological safety in our online classes and engage all students with critical thinking. If you liked what you heard today, please hit subscribe and give us a five-star rating. Want to connect? On Twitter, you can follow the show at SYS Presents. We love hearing from you. If you're interested in finding out more about SYS Education and our products and services, head over to syseducation.org. Lastly, this podcast wouldn't be possible without our exceptional team at SYS Education, including our dream team, consisting of sound engineer Natalie Farrell, graphic designer and social media and website manager Lexi Boren, and our producer, Bo Neal. Thanks for listening today, and remember, we can learn new things.